retired as a professor at Oregon State University. He was a professor in the Department of Horticulture and uh, taught plant identification, plant propagation, plant physiology. And he told me a uh, story of how he was always interested in plants. But one day he went on a field trip with the Sierra Club in the East Bay near San Francisco, a place called Coyote Hills Regional Park. This was on the first Saturday of May in 1978. And while he was there, he just had this recognition of all the birds that were there and decided right then that he needed to get into learning more about that field. So that Monday, two days later, he got binoculars and he's been a birder ever since for 44 years. Um, he's led trips for Corvallis Audubon. He and his wife, Lena, have birded in most of the countries of Central and South America and have birded extensively in Australia as well. Um, so his the title of his program tonight is Birding Bolivia Amid Re Regime Change and Climate Change. Thank you. No, not even up to his knees in the water. So I think we have two inches. Right. There were no almost so, divers, which tend to indicate there's no water. Yeah. Sure. Okay. All right. Thanks for coming out. I feel like I'm under the gun, so I'll start shaving stories here as I go along. We're going to go to Bolivia. Maybe just a light in the corner. Yeah, there you go. Uh, so a little review that uh, Bolivia is in the more or less the center of South America. Uh, it's uh, got surprising number of birds. It's, it's farther from the equator than uh, Colombia and Peru and Ecuador, of course, but uh, it's still in the tropics uh, and has a lot of birds because it's a very diverse landscape. So uh, you probably think of Bolivia if you thought about it at all as an Andean nation, but about half of the country is lowland, hot and steamy uh, forest and uh, savanna and wetlands and so forth. So between that and the complex topography of the uh, Andes, uh, plenty of birds to go see. I went down there with these two people. Uh, the one on the right is Charles Singleton of Nashville, Tennessee, who goes by Bubba. Uh, we met Bubba in West Mexico a number of years ago and uh, got along really well. We've traveled several times since. Uh, he was the one who wanted to go to Bolivia, and I figured, well, since he's been uh, coming along on my projects, I have to go along on his. Uh, oh, sorry. The uh, guy on the left is uh, John Thaw of Corvallis. Uh, he and his wife had just retired in Corvallis in 2005. Uh, but we actually met him on a uh, trip in Brazil. Uh, John travels extensively, almost obsessively, so he's a pretty easy target uh, to get to go on one of these trips. All right, so we've selected a Bolivian company to go with, Bird Bolivia. Uh, they have a really nice website on uh, specialties to find in Bol Bolivia and how to find them, how to get around in Bolivia on your own, which I'm far too timid to do. And they have a bunch of tours which feature um, uh, various uh, aspects of, of the bird life down there. And of course, being the, the gritty types that we are, we pick the hardcore Bolivian specialties. Uh, this comes in two parts. Uh, we took the uh, almost three week version uh, that uh, samples the uh, lower elevations of Bolivia. And then you can take a 10 day part to go to the, the higher elevations. Uh, the founder and operator of Bird Bolivia is Ruth Alipaz, who is a remarkable woman. She's uh, an indigenous uh, Bolivian from northern Bolivia, and she has dedicated her life to uh, improving the, uh, well, being a conservationist, first of all, but also improving the lot of in indigenous Bolivians, which can be uh, a bit of a problem. And it was her stature and reputation that she's gained over the years that enabled us to get through this adventure. Uh, so an outline, and we'll, we'll review this, we flew into uh, Santa Cruz uh, the, in the center of the uh, country uh, in, in the lowlands. It's the main, it's the largest city of Bolivia. And it's the uh, commercial uh, mining uh, agricultural capital uh, of the country. 
From there, we uh, went up north uh, to various habitats, back to Santa Cruz, and then up west of there into the lower Andes. All right, in the run up to this trip, nothing was easy. Uh, it was always a problem. Uh, airlines, uh, now, because of the, the uh, regime in Bolivia for a number of years, which I'll get to, uh, there was a very poor relationship between uh, American companies and Bolivia. So American Airlines was dealing with that. And eventually they were going to just flying to Santa Cruz every other day. Okay, we don't want to come in the night before the tour. It's just a matter of practice because you could easily be late. Uh, it has only gotten worse. Uh, so we came in two days ahead. Uh, then while we were out in the field, they uh, quit flying to Bolivia entirely, <laughs> but they got us home. Uh, Bolivia requires a tourist visa, which a lot of countries do, but it's really a sort of a pro forma thing and essentially a tax to raise some money. That's fine. Uh, Bolivia's was more involved and uh, it really is a process that makes you ask yourself, how badly do I want to go to Bolivia? Okay, well, badly enough. And, but don't let that stop you because I helped John Fa uh, apply for his. And so I've got a nice summary that actually makes it fairly easy to do. Uh, the currency doesn't matter tonight, but the politics uh, were a big issue for us and kind of the central theme tonight. It revolves around President Evo Morales, who's really a remarkable character. He, in, in almost 200 years of independence from Spain, Bolivia has had 190 coups and revolutions. So it's kind of a, uh, a type specimen of unstable Latin American governments. So for an, and these had all been white people, military and, and mine owners and so forth that had been fighting over control of the country. So here's an indigenous person who had been a coca grower, come up through the coca growers union, gotten into politics and has the skill and charisma to become president. So he's left-wing socialist, avowedly socialist. He's elected during the Bush II administration. So that was a large chunk of the reason why we had poor relations in those years, because we always you know, are alarmed about that. But uh, Morales had embarked then on a big program to narrow the inequality gap. And uh, what we could see down there that there were uh, new clinics and every little village and schools were had either been built or rebuilt looked great down there well to pay for all this then bolivia is going to have to pretty much have a uh, resource extractive economy and so everything was on the table they were traditionally silver and tin miners but they've got an oil and gas uh, industry they were uh, cutting trees uh, opening up more land for grazing and so forth. And so the, the last point then that Morales wanted to do all these things on his own way. Uh, so he separated himself from the global capitalist system uh, and um, that had caused some, some problems as well. On the downside, uh, the Bolivian constitution uh, says that he can have, uh, a president can serve two successive terms. So in October of 19, he was going for his fourth. So the tension in the country had gotten really high. Uh, and over the previous 12 years, instead of uh, building a deep bench of young politicians and technocrats to take over for him and continue his policies, he considered he'd come to see himself as the indispensable person. Okay, fancy that. Uh, and so there have been various corruption scandals along the way. Uh, he had kept all these plates spinning by polarizing the uh, uh, voting population, mainly indigenous against whites and mestizos, but according to our guide, highland indigenous versus lowland indigenous. And then the last point, the, um, because of the resource extraction headlong, then his environmental policies were disastrous and the fact that uh, Ruth Alipaz, and I forgot to mention her husband is a North American named Bennett Hennessy, who is the director of Armenia, the uh, uh, Bolivian conservation organization. So they're up against a, a major problem. All right, so they had this election about two weeks before we went down 
And there were several candidates in the first round, but to avoid a second round, the leader had to win by 10 percentage points or more. Uh, so in the early returns, Morales is ahead by a few points, but then all of a sudden the power goes out. And when it comes back on, lo and behold, Morales is up by more than 10 points. So the country erupts. All right. So there was rioting and, and the demonstrations and the usual thing. Uh, but a Bolivian tradition is to uh, set up roadblocks at mostly in you know, the cities and key interchanges and so forth. Uh, and these are respected. So apparently they're not attacked by the opposition. Convoys of truckers don't get organized and, and ram their way through. When it's blocked, it's blocked. Okay? You can walk through, take your bike through, but no, no uh, vehicles, no, no motor vehicles. We were advised our first morning to not take photos of these things. Uh, who knows, we could be uh, authorities who are going to take their photos and prosecute them later. So we just pulled a couple off the internet. Uh, usually they're in cities and towns, but they can be anywhere as we'll see later. So we came into Santa Cruz Airport a little after midnight uh, in the upper uh, right there and uh, got the hotel shuttle. And a really smart thing that we did without really understanding how serious these uh, shutdowns were is that we wanted Ruth to book a hotel near the airport just to get there and get some sleep. Okay, so we were at the, the Sun Hotel uh, on the left side. There, so the, the shuttle comes down and at that interchange, then there's a blockade, of course. We've got a highway and, and an interchange to the airport. So the van pulls over, we get out, grab our suitcases and walk a few hundred yards to the hotel. So that was an interesting experience right off the bat. And that'll be my refrain tonight is, well, that was interesting. <laughs> All right, so we've got two days uh, to get uh, get through before the tour starts. And so uh, John and Bubba and I birded the hotel grounds and there's a, a lake on the west side of the property and some brush uh, that's fenced off on the other side. And we saw some good birds, but routine stuff, but we're just getting our legs stretched out and, and going. Uh, but then uh, Bubba and I wanted to, it's really hot, okay? So John wanted to go to his room and cool off, but Bubba and I, I uh, wanted to bird these grasslands between the hotel and the airport. They're the airport grasslands, they're an eBird hotspot, uh, uh, but you have to ask permission from the airport administration. Uh, so we were going out there and watching birds along the way, and then we saw three European birders. And we thought, there are no tourists in Bolivia, what's going on here? Well, it was two Brits and a Swede. Uh, and so they had come all that way and their guide was based in Santa Cruz. And he had said, I can't run this tour because we can't get out of Santa Cruz and uh, nobody else can either. So the lodges are shut down. So I was too stunned to ask, well, why didn't he tell you this before you came down? <laughs> uh, and so they, well, what are you doing? Well, we know we can, uh, even if we have to walk from the Sun Hotel to the airport, then we're flying around in northern Bolivia, so we can at least do the first half of our tour. After that, we'll see. So a pretty chilling start <laughs> to the trip. Can we do this or not? All right, so then that afternoon, oh, it's hot, okay, that's what that's supposed to show. Uh, this guy shows up, our guide, Sandro Valdez. Uh, Sandro grew up in the Medivi National Park, which we'll go to in a few minutes, and uh, as a, uh, as young man had learned uh, a great deal about the wildlife and, and birds out there. And so he'd been very useful, uh, helpful to various scientific expeditions that had come out there and they encouraged him to do more. And so as Ruth Olipaz was setting up her company, Indigenous Bolivian Company, she wanted an Indigenous guide. She'd heard about Sandro, so she went out and talked to him and he's telling this story and he said, oh, you know, I had no self-confidence and I didn't think I knew enough. Uh, I didn't think I could deal with those foreigners. And I, I just, I turned her down. So then at some point later, weeks or months, Bennett Hennessy, who's a much more forceful personality, comes out and says, look, this is really important to the country to, to start doing this sort of thing and attract people to, to uh, see our birds and wildlife in order to save them. So he said, give it a try. So he tried it 
10 or 15 years later, he finds that he is good at it. Uh, the clients are easy to deal with. He's making good money. He wishes there were more tourists in Bolivia. So the next day then, uh, Sandro took us around on the same uh, uh, area that uh, uh, we birded the day before. And all of a sudden there's all kinds of stuff popping up because he can hear, right? It makes sense to him. So he can call in uh, a variety of uh, ant shrikes and, and ant wren, uh, cuckoos, lots of other stuff. He just uh, brazenly walked, took us out into the airport grasslands and we saw birds out there and they, pretty soon a pickup of two uniformed guards comes by and uh, they start having a discussion. It's pretty civil, but pointed. And we're kind of working our way back to the road. We get to the road and they go back to the airport and we go to the hotel. So it was better that he did that than, than Bubba and I, I guess. All right, finally ready to start. So from Santa Cruz, we're going up to River Alta in the north part of the country. Uh, it's in the Amazon basin, so it's a heavy forest up there. Uh, River Alta is a busy uh, uh, mining and uh, timber town, a uh, very basic sort of place. Uh, our hotel was on the second floor of this building. Uh, it was comfortable, uh, at least in my room. The air conditioning didn't work, but I had a good fan. If you get a little wind chill, you're fine. Uh, the restaurants were very basic as well uh, and uh, usually open. Uh, the couple on the left there are Ron and Rita who are from Belgium and we rounded out our roster. Yeah. So we're out in the woods, uh, some second growth, uh, all of it disturbed, but uh, some in really good shape going out on paths through the forest. Uh, we encountered this. Uh, so Ruth and Bennett, are working with the indigenous people there. If they're not Ruth's community, they're at least neighbors of hers and uh, trying to you know, set up these uh, ecotourism arrangements, but they could not uh, uh, bypass, turn down uh, doing some logging. So they, they hammered out an agreement uh, to take out the most uh, valuable trees, leave the forest pretty well intact. So Sandro told us that this site had looked like that the previous year. All right, uh, so the main target out here, there were lots of birds, but the main endemic is uh, masked ant pitta. Uh, at one point, this was lumped with another species, the spotted ant pitta, I think, which is more broadly distributed, but some ornithologists got around to looking uh, studying the specimens and realized, well, this doesn't look anything like a spotted ant pitta. So they started studying uh, this, and this particular bird is just from a tiny area right around River Alta. Uh, fortunately, it can tolerate disturbance, which there's plenty of out there is uh, just evidence that they're logging there, but the population seems to be stable and it's doing okay. I put this up because even though we saw the bird, it was way too dark and the bird was too busy to get a photograph. And out in the jungle, you get a lot of photographs like these. So we saw lots of ant birds and fly catchers and mannequins and that sort of thing. Uh, but uh, also uh, an Attila, buff-breasted wren, gray-headed tanager, black-fronted nunbird, green-backed trogon, or sorry, a laughing falcon, a variety of oral pendulas and caciques, redneck woodpecker and uh, cream colored woodpecker, Amazon kingfisher, shrike, tyrant mannequin. I picture an ornithologist figuring out is this a flycatcher or a mannequin? Just what is it? Mm -hmm. Tyrant mannequin. Common for two. There are quite a few birds at many of the sites, I mean, butterflies in the, many of the sites that we visited. Uh, my lepidopterist colleague at OSU is Paul Hammond, and he's always uh, interested to see what I bring home from there. So the identities are his. Uh, a few sweat bees were the main uh, insect that uh, were irritating. They, they go for the eyes and nose and mouth, but they don't sting particularly. Uh, this tall tree on the right is a Brazil nut, and uh, Brazil nut harvest had just finished in River Alta. There were piles of husks around town, 
And uh, it's worth mentioning because uh, uh, Brazil nut production depends on a healthy uh, tropical rainforest. You can grow the trees in plantations with the insect pollinators that they need to pollinate the flowers to set seed won't grow in a plantation. They need healthy forest. Uh, so that's limited the uh, uh, Brazil nut to being a forest crop. All right, uh, about time to leave River Alta. And this just reminds me though, that uh, one, of, one of the parts of climate change in Bolivia as elsewhere is when's the wet season gonna start? Uh, while we were there, uh, it was coming in fits and starts, uh, and, but uh, they don't know if it's gonna be a good one or an inundation or too dry or what. All right, we were supposed to go from River Alta to Trinidad to see some birds, uh, uh, endemic birds around uh, uh, Trinidad, stay the night and then go out to Barba Azul Nature Reserve. But the day before we left, uh, were to leave River Alta, we found that Trinidad was shut down. Our flight was canceled. So we were gonna lose our day in Trinidad. So we were able to get out, plenty of birds in River Alta though. So we missed some good ones, but there's still plenty to see do that. So we are able to fly to Trinidad, walk across the airport, load into a pair of small planes, and we flew for a little over two hours across this vast wilderness. It was amazing. Uh, savanna and grasslands and wetlands. Uh, and so I don't know exactly how fast these planes go, but let's say we're 250 or 300 miles way out there. Uh, so there's the, the Barba Azul Nature Reserve with this little eco lodge uh, that was built by Armenia and the American Bird Conservancy. Uh, pretty standard sort of thing. Uh, we uh, checked in and the manager's wife, Yuli, and uh, little son, Carlos or Carlito, because dad is also Carlos, welcomed us. Now, I suppose two-year-olds would respond in this way to strangers, but we're really strangers. This is a very isolated community of Yuli and Carlos and their son, Yuli's sister and her husband and their son, and two or three other young men comprise the whole crew that are stuck uh, at the preserve for most of the year. And they've been doing this for, for two years. Anyway, Carlos isn't so sure about what's going on, but mom talks him into giving us a nice smile. All right, so Barba Azul means blue beard in Spanish. And so this preserve was set up to uh, protect the blue-throated macaw. At one point it was thought to be extinct, but uh, uh, some birds trickled through the pet trade somewhere. So there must be some. And so expeditions eventually uh, found uh, maybe 50 birds uh, out in this wilderness here. The population was that small. So the American Bird Conservancy and Armenia and wealthy donors then set about to buy the ranch that comprises Barba and Sewell and another ranch near Trinidad, which we couldn't see, uh, called the Laney Rickman Preserve. All right, so besides the uh, pet trade, the habitat loss was uh, harming this bird. And the reason was uh, uncontrolled burning. Now, ranchers the world over burn off the old grass to stimulate the new grass when the rains start. Uh, but these aren't controlled burns, okay? They're covering millions of acres. And so, uh, since I don't have a pointer, but uh, some of these areas you can see have been uh, whittled away, eroded by fire, and they happen to be, have been a palm species, which the blue-throated macaw depends on for food and nest cavities, okay? So uh, since then, uh, the palms have grown back pretty well. Uh, so food is starting to be produced, but they're probably short on nest cavities. Uh, so, oh, here's the bird, uh, big, gorgeous macaw. We saw oh, two or three dozen of them around. Uh, now, so if they don't have enough nest cavities, what about nest boxes? So at the Rickman Preserve near Trinidad, uh, nest boxes have been very successful. And so they have to date fledged 105 birds from those boxes. So altogether, that plus natural reproduction has pushed the population from 50 up a little over 400. Okay. 
Uh, and so um, does, the circumstances don't matter, but Lena and I are supporting the nest box program. And so on the left, we have the Lena Probsting nest box and on the right, the William Probsting nest box. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, okay, so population of 400 birds, two major populations, one uses nest boxes, but the ones at Barbara Azul have refused to use the nest boxes. That's really interesting to me. All right, lots of other birds out there. So uh, a similar macaw, the blue and yellow, lots of those. Chestnut-fronted macaw, white-winged bacard, black-tailed tatyra, white-barred piculat, so that's a woodpecker-like creature. Rufus proud pepper shrike, shrupial, couple of species of wood creepers. Toucans were fairly regular. Uh, Tinamous are generally skulkers in the forest, but this is a grassland bird, so you can see that. Rufus ornaros were fairly common, but a quick story, they make uh, adobe nests, uh, hence the uh, ornero means oven in Spanish. And so you may have heard of the uh, large group of Latin American birds called the oven birds. Well, this is where the name comes from. Not all oven birds make adobe nests, but these do. Uh, the uh, nest that these birds make inspired the early settlers of Argentina to make better adobe, to make better structures. And so this is the national bird of Argentina. I think that's a sweet story. There was an amazing amount of wildlife out at Barba Azul. So howler monkeys. Uh, this is an albino agouti. Uh, uh, Sandro has hunted a lot and eaten a lot of agouti in his time, but he had never seen an albino. So this just blew him away. And I was able to fire off this shot. And every time he saw one of his buddies or anybody else for that matter on the trip, uh, he'd start talking about this albino agouti and make me uh, show the photo to prove that it was really true. Uh, and then a, a real bonus one morning, uh, not far from where our path was the uh, giant anteater. All right, one day we came in for lunch and uh, we learned that Carlos, little Carlos was turning two. So we had a little party and sang for him and he shared his cake. Great time was had by all. One morning we went out to bird the grasslands of Barba Azul. So one of their major objectives is to keep fire out. Right, because they want to preserve those palms, but they also want to preserve the old growth grass, which some species don't mind the burned landscape, burned grassland, but some do. They want this complex uh, habitat. So we looked at the birds out there, such as black masked finch, sharp tailed tyrant, wedge tailed grass finch, cocktail tyrant. Isn't that a neat little tail? They, there was an oxbow lake on the preserve. So we birded out there and saw a variety of wetland type birds, such as a Donacobius. Uh, grayish bay wing is a starling, uh, but it's not a particularly a parasite. It's not an obligate parasite. It's parasitized more by other starlings than it does other species. Red crested cardinal, yellow chin spine tail, Orinoco goose. A variety of waders, including habirus, jabirus. And another bonus was a chimango caracara, which is a grassland bird from Argentina, which is a, an occasional vagrant up in Bolivia. All right, so this is a big, wonderful place, you know, out in the middle of nowhere. And uh, it was just uh, my favorite spot of the whole, whole trip. But finally, it was time to leave. And by the way, the best food of the whole trip was cooked by Yuli and her sister. <laughs> yeah, just basic stuff, you know, like I, in a way I get it home, but the herbs, uh, the local herbs were just so good and interesting that uh, I just really enjoyed uh, how she took care of us. All right, so our planes pick us up and now take us over to the base of the Andes at a town called Rurinabaki. And we had a great story there, which I don't have time for. Uh, okay, to the left here, it's flat for hundreds of miles all the way back to River Alta. To the west, to the right, then the Andes rise abruptly. So we're heading into the lower reaches of the Andes. 
uh, up to about 2,000 feet. So it's a little bit cooler up there. And we're going to a place called Madidi National Park. Now, many of you have been to or, or at least heard of Manu National Park in Peru, which is celebrated as the most biodiverse forest on earth. Well, Madidi is every bit as diverse, possibly more so, and nobody's heard of it. Nobody goes to Bolivia. Uh, even scientists don't particularly work there. It's easier to go to Peru, uh, but it's a wonderful resource. Uh, it's been under assault, uh, of course, even before Morales came in, but with his policies, uh, they really want to go after it. Uh, a lot of trees there, a lot of potential agricultural ground. Uh, there's a dam site they'd like to uh, build on there. And so Sandro, who lives here, told us all sorts of hair-raising stories, but his larger community with conservationists have been able to stave off the uh, development so far. The, the dam seems to be off the table right now. We went to a place called Sadiri Lodge, which was a fairly new site run by the local indigenous community there. Uh, and I, I was thinking before we got there that they would have this great garden with all kinds of hummingbird flowers and the feeders would be up and we'd really get to see up close several species, but it was empty. And the story was that uh, everything was working great at first, but then a large aggressive species called the gray-breasted saber wing had gradually exerted control over the garden and kept everybody out. But the saber wing doesn't use the feeders either. Uh, whenever uh, another species would come to a feeder, boom, they were uh, driven off immediately. So that was interesting. We saw plenty of hummingbirds. We just had to work harder to see them. The forest was beautiful. Uh, there are all kinds of shapes and colors out there. It was, it was a stunning place. Uh, this road uh, goes 30 miles to, uh, uh, at least 30 miles, but out to uh, Sandro's community. So he's, he lives way out there. And there were birds, plenty of birds. Yeah. Paradise tanager, yellow crested, two-banded warbler and riverbank warbler, a white hawk, a brown wing chiffornis, which was a great find. I don't have time to tell you about that, but it's a notorious skulker. The uh, young man on the right is Rodrigo, and he was the natural history expert for the local community and helped us and Sandro with the birding. And so he gets credit for finding a crested owl out there. You know, as you're studying the birds beforehand, you think, gee, that would be a neat one to see. And you think, right, but Rodrigo found one. All right, so great time at Medidi's, time to uh, move on. So we're going from Rurinabaki to Santa Cruz via La Paz. And so as I said, your picture of Bolivia may still be uh, the Andes and the Altiplano and so forth. So here's your dose of it through the airplane window at the end of the day. There are mountains and the plains with the old la ancient land use patterns there. Really interesting, but on to Santa Cruz. Santa Cruz is locked down. How in the world are we going to do what those Brits and Swedes and their guide couldn't do uh, a week and a half before? Well, this was our ace in the, ace in the hole. A uh, permit that Ruth was granted by the city of Santa Cruz because of her reputation as a fair, earnest player for good causes. Okay, and She was able to parlay that into getting them to help her run this uh, uh, bunch of tourists through Santa Cruz. So. Uh, it was really interesting because about every four or 500 yards, it seemed like there was a roadblock all the way to our hotel and nobody had ever seen one of these before. So they would pull it off the dash and look at it and feel the paper. They would open up the van door and see what was inside. Well, it's not food or fuel, something valuable. It's just tourists. Okay. Now, we never felt in danger at all throughout the trip, but it was really interesting to be uh, evaluated in that way. What would I do? <laughs> I'm just trusting Sandro and Ruth to get me through this. I otherwise, no idea what's going on. So we made it in, made it out of town the next day. So uh, Santa Cruz is here and we worked up to the uh, west in the lower Andes 
to Sanme Pata, which was our base, instead of going to some other lodges which were closed. We could go back to those sites, but we couldn't stay in that lodge. Uh, Amboro National Park and another place. We got as far west as the uh, Red Fronted Macaw Lodge, Komarapa, and on out. Sanme Pata is a tourist town, but for Bolivian. So it's at about 5,000 feet. Uh, and so people from Santa Cruz come up to get out of the heat. And it was a nice area. Uh, in Sanme Pata, we noticed that there was a poster featuring this guy who you remember, Che Guevara, uh, Fidel Castro's right-hand man uh, back in the 60s. And Che has this great reputation as a revolutionary, but as far as I know, he failed miserably wherever he went around the globe to foment uh, revolution. So his last hurrah was to be chucked into Bolivia and foisted on the poor Bolivians. I mean, uh, they're unstable and so forth. But he came in and the uh, Brazilian, uh, Bolivian military and the CIA were all over him. So he lurched around the countryside south of Samipata, trying to elude his pursuers, finally was cornered and killed. So this is a, a poster now for people who want to come up and follow that trail. So instead of a, a birding trail, or a wine trail or an artisan trail, they've got the Sendero de Che, the Che Trail to come up. So that's tourism in Bolivia. <laughs> One place we visited was this, was this stunning landscape called Los Volcanes. There aren't volcanoes at all, it's an eroded sandstone uh, formation. Down in the valley in the center was an eco lodge which was closed. We birded our way down there and Ruth got the staff who are all local to come down and make us a nice lunch. And it was a great day down there. Uh, Short-tailed ant thrush, a couple of jays, plush crested and purplish, masked trojan, squirrel cuckoo, spot-breasted thornbirds who are oven birds, but they make a thorny nest, rufous-bellied thrush. And uh, as we were, Going up, Sandro said, gee, every time I've been here, I've seen a fair de lance, which is a notorious poisonous snake of Latin America. So 10 minutes later, we saw a young one and it was scuttling out of the way as fast as it could, which was fine with me. The best butterflies of the trip were down there. Paul says that there are probably three species of sulfurs here. All right, so another trip then was to go out to Amboro National Park. We got up really early in Same Pata and drove out in the rain and went down this uh, muddy road, which was in really good shape. Uh, found a uh, this little uh, indigenous uh, community with, with this porch and our drivers, uh, we, at that point we had two vans for five people. On the left is Herman, uh, who was a, a local lad and Carlos on the right. And uh, so they were interesting characters, great drivers, but out of those vans, they produced a breakfast that Holiday Inn would be jealous of. They had uh, bacon and eggs and muesli and yogurt and great coffee and one thing after juice and all sorts of things. Uh, so finally the rain let up and we birded out in the, in the forest. It was gorgeous. Uh, the river was up, but not as much as I would have expected for the amount of rain. This is a southern monarch. Uh, it's a non-migratory species. Sorry for the focus. Uh, the rain was a problem, but uh, feeding on milkweed. Caterpillar feeding on milkweed. How about that? Great for two this time instead of a common. Plumius kite next to uh, a nest. Amiated woodpecker, chestnut backed ant shrike, curly vented pygmy tyrant, another trogon. Oh, and in the meantime, Morales had resigned after all these protests. Wow. So now uh, the people in Santa Cruz, which is the, the center of the opposition to him, they can relax a bit. But now the Morales forces. Uh, who had been demonstrating and blockading. Now they're mad as hornets, so things turn around a bit. Uh, and so from uh, uh, 
Amboro, which was really wet and heavy rainforest. Now we're going to start going west. In Bolivia, all of the moisture comes from the east, from Brazil. And so everything's wet up to the first range of the Andes, and then it's progressively drier after that. Just like the Cascades here going east, except ridge after ridge after ridge. Okay, so watch how the vegetation changes. There's Amboro. There's another forest. There's another one. There's another one. Then we're getting into cacti. And now we're out here. And that's as the crow flies, less than 50 miles. Uh, so we're in a river valley. I've forgotten the name of the river. Uh, abjectly poor agricultural communities who depend on the river for irrigation. But this river, since it doesn't rain here much, this river comes from the Andes, from the perennial glaciers and snowfields, which are disappearing. So we uh, get to our destination. We cross the Placid River. There's a little community over on the other side here. And then this project, the Red Fronted Macaw Lodge, which is another project of Armenia and the American Bird Conservancy. So uh, the Red Fronted Macaw uh, has a range in South Central uh, Bolivia here in the Andes. Uh, it nests on cliffs, so that's fine, but they're vulnerable to predation, uh, nest, uh, nest raiding, poaching, is the word. And so part of the deal here is then that the uh, locals uh, uh, stay on top of the guard, the top of the cliffs during nesting season to prevent poaching. Uh, the habitat that this macaw needs is a uh, thorn forest that's in good shape. It still needs to be diverse and fairly mature, and that's declining pretty rapidly as, for, as firewoods cut and land is uh, cleared for pastures and so forth. So this bird is um, uh, critically endangered. Uh, we were going to go up the next day on top of the cliffs and get see the birds more closely, but we couldn't do that, as you'll see in a bit. But we did see some uh, birds uh, cycling around out there in front of the cliffs. There was also cliff parakeet and cliff flycatcher, white-fronted woodpecker. This is the same genus as, as Lewis's and uh, acorn, by the way. Blue and yellow tanager. A gnat catcher, ultramarine grosbeak, another grosbeak, a couple of finches, bicolored hawk. This is maybe my favorite was the white tipped plant cutter. There's three or four genera of this, uh, mostly in so southern South America. They have a serrated bill so they can chew uh, leaves and vegetative buds, which uh, is interesting because birds have high metabolism. We think of them as needing concentrated food sources such as fruit or insects or fish or reptiles or what have you, but somehow they survive on leaves and buds. All right, so in the middle of the night, then I uh, heard, well, the rain started and it's raining hard and it's raining when we get up the next morning and it hadn't rained there for three years. And now there's water pouring off the cliffs there on the other side. Uh, so we have breakfast on the porch and we bird from the porch and people are collecting water. Uh, the potable water for this village come, is, is trucked in from Sucre, which is a town uh, some distance away. So they're, they're in dire straits there. Uh, this little guy probably had never seen rain before, <laughs> ruining his day. Uh, this was the main hummingbird there uh, and it's called glittering belly hummingbird. And uh, down in Southern South America, are a variety of warbling finches, ringed and black and rufous and others. Saffron-billed sparrow, striped-crowned spinetail, parakeet, and another parakeet. And I always love to see this sort of thing. Saltator, another woodpecker, puffbird. Okay, so we had a nice morning birding around the ground through the little village, through the weedy fields, brushy fields, really good birding. So we get back and Sandra gets a phone call and it's Ruth. And so whatever her intelligence sources are, she says that uh, the main bridge back to the other side of not the river we just crossed, but another 
river between us and getting back to Santa Cruz has been blocked by the Morales people. Uh, so, uh oh, <laughs> we got to get out of there because there is one other bridge, it turns out. There are not many um, alternate routes in South America. You go in and you come out. Okay. But in this case, there was an alternative. Uh, there was the river. Remember, we just had crossed that the day before. So we weren't going back across that, but there was an alternate route that got us back. The Morales people had not gotten to the bridge that we crossed. So we were back now into the area of Comarapa. Now, whereas the blockades down in Santa Cruz were pretty much permanent for the duration of uh, the unrest, the Morales people, at least in this area, were kind of doing a shoot and scoot where they'd set up a blockade for a few hours and take it down and move somewhere else. And I don't know what the point of that was, but uh, we would just go through to the path of least, least resistance, okay? Can't go in that direction, we'll bird over here. So over the several days in Comarapa, we got to, got to, uh, to see everything. Uh, I'm showing this because in this little agricultural valley here, and I forget what bird we were looking for, they were harvesting strawberries and you could smell them from this distance. So, uh, you know, the Latins love the uh, fruit juices. And so on the menu at our hotel was uh, strawberry juice. And so that night for dinner, John and Bubba and I ordered a pitcher and it was fantastic. So we had a pitcher uh, for every meal and it was a great memory. All right, so uh, at some point uh, then, uh, I had a knock on the door one night in Comarapa in the hotel. I thought it was um, probably just Sandro updating us on another schedule change. But so I opened the door and uh, after dinner, and, and there's three people there: uh, Sandro, the innkeeper, and another person. So uh, it turns out that some hmm. Venezuelans have been shipped into Bolivia uh, by the socialist President Maduro from Venezuela. So I guess to help his socialist comrades somehow, I don't know how, uh, but they'd been picked up almost immediately by the police. And so the order went out to check all travelers. So this police detective in Comarapa came to our hotel and asked the innkeeper uh, who's staying here tonight. And he said, well, I've got five foreign tourists. And his suspicions are instantly aroused because he said, we don't have tourists in Bolivia. And so they go to talk to Sandro and he shows him the roster with these names and passports and everything. He says, well, show me one. Hence the knock on the door. <laughs> Police detective, no threats whatsoever, really nice guy. Uh, and so he says, well, what are you doing? Well, he asked me my name, he wants to see the passport, see my tourist visa. Uh, what are you doing here? And well, we're watching birds from our guide is Sandro. We're having a great time. I didn't say too much. And just, just answer the question. And so we went through a few more questions and that was it, thank you very much. And so it turns out that I'm the, the type specimen for this uh, rare bird, the tourist in Bolivia. <laughs> they actually exist. All right, wrapping this up, uh, we went, uh, spent most of our time above Comarapa in the Siberia cloud forest. Siberia pronounced in English is Siberia. Uh, so ordinarily, this uh, ridge is clothed in fog. So it's dark and cold and wet in Siberia, but it's less and less a cloud forest now. Now it was a beautiful place. It, the air reminded me of the Bay Area uh, where it was just this perfect breeze coming through. But uh, the uh, forest there that's adapted to that high, high moisture is not getting that now. So it will be changing over time. There was the occasional puff of cloud coming from the east, but it couldn't really establish itself. It would burn off fairly quickly. So beautiful place. With a few birds, lots of birds actually. Cotinga, pearl tree runner. It's one of those obscured photos, but it's a great bird. <laughs> Flower piercer and a black-throated thistletail. <laughs> there we out in the Andes, there were, uh, we saw uh, condors fairly regularly. They were usually a long ways away, but that's what you have telephoto lenses for. And at the other end of the spectrum, uh, my favorite hummingbird was the red-tailed comet. Uh, it's right up there, I think, with the booted racket tail. 
uh, as being a great looking bird. Okay, so I got to get back down to Santa Cruz the next day and Sandro briefs us on what to expect and so forth. There's two known blockades by the Morales people down near Santa Cruz blocking us from getting uh, the van to Santa Cruz. So we're bopping along in the morning and uh, all of a sudden out in the middle of nowhere, there's a blockade, okay? Uh, there's nobody, we can walk through this, but there's nobody, no taxi waiting for us on the other side. So fortunately they had this tactic of being up for a few hours and then moving on. So 30 or 40 minutes later, they took it down and we went on through, did that again, got down, uh, heading down the hill into Santa Cruz and we stopped in the village that Herman grew up in, grabbed his brother, went down to the first barricade. The brother took the van back. We took our luggage and walked through the, the barricade uh, roadblock and um, nobody really paid us any mind. You know, no threats, no, uh, nothing like that. There might've been idle curiosity of uh, European types coming through there. Now, a lot of people wanted to be moving up and down the highway. So there's a big parking lot on one side and somehow there were a bunch of taxis on the other. So we got into a taxi and drove several miles to the next barricade, repeat, go on through. And then the local municipality had sent city buses out there to take people in. So we got into El Torres in good shape, waiting for Carlos to come out for us. Right above me was a sloth. <laughs> Uh, and so we got back to the Sun Hotel, got cleaned up and uh, uh, said our goodbyes. And I can't say enough about uh, these two people, what they uh, put up with uh, to deal with a very difficult situation. Uh, if you really want to do some good, you know, know, know that you're doing some good ecotourism, take a tour in Bolivia because they really need it. Uh, what these people are, are doing is just amazing. Thank you very much. Yeah. This isn't about birds, but I don't remember the dust settling on the whole uh, election thing. Uh, what happened there? All right, so Morales went out and then uh, <laughs> uh, they controlled the government. So uh, they should have had one of his um, uh, younger, more junior ministers take over, but they resigned in protest. So they gave up. Power and so a woman from one of the conservative parties took over, and she turned out to be kind of strange, but she did shepherd through everything. She got everything sorted out uh, so that they had an election the next year, and a Morales protege won that. He wasn't leading the preliminary rounds by ten points, but the uh, the conservative opponent was gracious enough to say it's yours. So there was a little bit of peace there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Time of year, oh. and then when when is the rainy season? Then? Right, so it would be our winter is their rainy season, and so it should have been. We we started in late October, uh, and went into November. It should have been starting then. It was going in fits and starts. Yeah. I wondered about you. Um, you mentioned that you were sponsoring the birdhouse. Sponsor. Why? You bet. So if, if you're interested, I'll we'll send you the dope. So I was so impressed with these people that I got home and made a donation to Armenia. And so then uh, uh, sometime later, we got a thank you note from a woman. So the preserve there is the Laney Rickman Preserve. She was a wealthy Texan who got interested in this project, you know, a lot of energy and, and spearheaded purchasing that ranch and getting it up and going, but she died young of cancer. And but we got a letter from her sister, Dorothy Patterson, who had picked up the torch and she told us about this program, uh, sponsor nest boxes. So we do that. And so now after a few years, we've got a collection of blue-throated macaw mugs, which we need, right? We, but we get a nice uh, bag of uh, gonzo shade grown coffee every year and decals and just uh, you know, a lot of fun. They tell us how our nest boxes are doing. We, we haven't uh, hatched or fledged a blue throated macaw yet, but there's other macaws and parrots that, that use these boxes too. It's fun. Uh, I saw a 
some of them were, were caught in the mess boxes, but the others did not. How did they mess? They did cavities. And so, so you know, so at Barba Azul, then most of the palms had been gone, so there are not many cavities there. And so it'd be really nice to augment it. I've been, I've wondered why you couldn't bring out, uh, bring those cultural genetics uh, out <laughs> to Barba Azul with some birds, but there may be problems with that too. Yeah. All right. Any ornithologist check uh, the other sites, see if there's actually any subspecies difference, right? A genetic difference. I doubt it if they've looked, but you wonder. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, it was such a small population to have that strong a, a difference in behavior, it's really interesting. And you know, maybe some subtle speciation. Yeah, I, don't, I have no idea. So, yeah. so those birds are like closed corvids. They're very smart. They have cultures. You know, if I can't get somebody from Texas, I'll like, send them to Nebraska. Yeah. yeah. I'm not at all surprised. I mean, you, right. I, when we were at, lived in Ashton, we had stellar jays. Within two days, one of the young stellar jays figured out how to put two peanuts in his throat. He, one down his throat, one on the side of his beak, and they all learned it. In about three days, <laughs> it took months for the ones in our yard here in Salem to mm -hmm. figure it out, <laughs> and they still don't do it yeah. very well. But so you know, it's culture. These birds are really smart. right. They're well, really so, smart and have to so one thing so that they, they really understand and they communicate. That. One one thing they did at the Rickman Preserve was to present the boxes in different ways. Yeah, and one thing that was really successful was to have the box on top of that tall pole, like I showed it. Barbara Azul, but none of that presentation has worked yeah. either. At Barbara, so. Yeah. 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 No questions on chat, so it's all you guys. Hmm. So, how many species did you count? Uh, 595 or four, something like that. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> lots of birds. And that was without being in Trinidad, for example. Mm -hmm. yeah. One after another, just a torrent. Yeah. What was Trinidad? Well, there were several uh, endemics. Sorry, <laughs> there were several endemics out there. First of all, and so I mean, anywhere you go, there's going to be a different suite of birds. Mm -hmm. So that was the main thing, but also to see the Rickman Preserve oh, for the blue throated macaw. So two two objectives there. Now, I, I've forgotten what the the local specialties were. Didn't see him. Yeah. All right, thank you very much. Thank you.